Good morning. I'm Tim Nyland, and today we are continuing our discussion from last week on the lost decade in stocks. We're going to move beyond the six warning signs to model the valuation implication for equity should equity risk premium begin to slowly rise and revert to its 20-year median trend over time. We are going to look at two different methods for modeling valuation changes associated with changes in equity risk premium. Be sure to stick around until the end of the webinar where I will toss the PowerPoint deck and do a live factor sensitivity analysis on Microsoft using the Zach's valuation model in the research system. Before we get started, please like, comment, and subscribe and come back every week for more videos on investing strategy and making the most of Zach's Pro platforms. If you'd like to do the kind of analysis you're going to see in this video, then you're going to need to have a ZAT portfolio manager subscription, which includes both Zach's advisor tools and the Zach's research system. Let's go ahead and get started. So again, today's webinar is part two of the Lost Decade and Equity series. And you can see up on the screen, I've got last week's webinar circled in red. If you haven't had a chance to look at it, um, please take some time and, and, and watch it. It's, uh, it provides some really, really nice context for what you're going to hear today. So let's go ahead and look at the lost decade again in the S&P 500. And this period of time was characterized by roughly the middle of 2000 to the end of 2012, where the S&P essentially turned 0%, returned 0% in, in price return, while at the same time earnings actually increased, um, by more than a factor of two. So, um, the end result was obviously this PE multiple compression that lasted uh, for a period of about 12 years. Uh, and you can see those earnings basically playing catch up uh, to price where price was just literally stagnant for 12 years. So last week we talked about the six warning signs, five of which have already been met. We're going to just run through a really, really quick review of those six warning signs and we'll jump right into the, uh, to the modeling. So again, uh, warning sign number one was that S&P 500 price return increasing 25% since pre-COVID. The significance here is this multiple expansion that you see. It looks strikingly similar to what we had pre.com. And um, other recessions that you can see on the screen here have been measured. Uh, their recoveries specifically were measured in years. Uh, COVID was literally measured in months. So that's just a, a tremendous valuation expansion on earnings that really still haven't been delivered. So there's a little bit of a risk there. Warning sign number two was this COVID recession rally in equities driving that PEF-12M multiple back to levels where the stage was set last time uh, in that dot-com era. And you can see that here. Um, I've got those two periods of time highlighted in red, circled in red for the S&P 500 composite. Warning sign number three was that COVID recession, that risk on rally in equities that we experienced through COVID um, has literally pushed equity risk premium back to levels that that where we had set the stage last time. So you can see that levels of equity risk premium uh, sitting here at, at pre.com levels, uh, about the same level now. And, and, and we had roughly the same levels of elevated PEs in both time periods. So huge, huge correlation um, between and, st and statistical significance uh, with equity risk premium being able to explain the movement in the S&P 500 PEF-12M uh, and, and, and a lot of statistical insignificance around 10-year treasuries. We talked about that last week. Warning sign number four, price relative to earnings action on the S&P 500. Again, this is a setup. Uh, it's very similar when you consider that we've got the same levels of PE for F12, uh, PE F12M now uh, as we did during the, um, the pre-loss decade period. And I've got that period highlighted here in red as well. So Two question marks out here to the right. We simply just don't know. Again, earnings are rolling over. We already know that we're going into more of a, a normalized earnings period with S&P earnings forecast to grow somewhere around 10, 11% over the next two years. Um, you know, just coming off a tremendous run up during this recovery period. So, um, if we peel back the layers of the onion, we get to warning sign number five and we look at these bellwether names in the S&P 500. And you can see that we've got price relative to earnings actions set up very similarly to the S&P 500. So again, that, that pre-loss decade time period of price and earnings, the PE multiple expansion, the distance between the blue and the orange line looking strikingly similar to what we are experiencing today. So again, the two question marks here, um, and we're actually going to be doing some analysis on Microsoft. So warning sign number six is the piece that we're missing. It's definitely the most complex, and that's what we're going to spend the rest of the webinar on. Um, the idea here, we asked some questions last week. What is the path of least resistance from current record low levels? 
Is it safe to assume that at some point in the future we'll revert back to that 5.11 20-year median? Um, I think it is. That's what I like to look at. Um, it's definitely got the most risk associated with it, so we need to at least acknowledge it. Um, and the fact that over the last 20 years, we've oscillated around that median quite a bit. So we're going to actually dive in and see what happens to equity valuations if equity risk premium reverts back to that 5.11 level in just a minute. But before we do that, what I wanted to do is take equity risk premium back a few more years um, and give everyone some good news in support of current equity valuations uh, and let you know that equity risk premium can actually go a lot lower. And um, so when you look at the chart on the screen here, I've actually brought equity risk premium back all the way to like 1988. And you can see that median was, in fact, a lot lower. It was actually, if you calculate, it's around 2.4% versus the current 20-year median sitting at about 5.11%. So, again, I like to look to the post.com era as a model for equity risk premium going forward. Um, but we must, must always remain aware of the historical context. Again, I talked about the importance of that last week. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to assume that equity risk premium and the 10-year treasury rise over time and revert to that 20-year trend, since this would definitely mark a challenge for equity valuation. So again, that level would be 5.11. Um, that would take us up to about right here. So that's what we'll be doing here in just a minute. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to dig in. We're going to run a macro factor sensitivity analysis on Microsoft using two methods. We're going to use the actual observed historical trend analysis in PEF 12M versus macro factors. This is super, super simple. I think you guys will be blown away how easy this is uh, using the Zach's research system. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to actually look at a Wall Street DCF model. So this is our own uh, Zach's equity valuation model. I've been involved in this thing uh, since its inception some all 30 years ago. And um, we've got quite a cult following for uh, valuation model users. Very, very accurate, very, very effective model. And then, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to model the following factors uh, reverting to their 20-year uh, median trend. So equity risk premium rising from the current level of 3.09 to 5.11. Ten-year treasuries rising from 1.29 to 2.9. That will give us a total equity discount rate rise of about 4.38% to 8.01. And all you're doing is just adding up equity risk premium in a tenure. Um, before we move on, though, I wanted to let everyone know that we've just rebalanced our ETF model portfolios for Q3 of 2021. And so we offer ETF model portfolios literally for every mandate. Um, they're all based on Zach's renowned ETF rank, as well as other factors to improve returns and, and reduce risk. So, Go ahead and click click on the link in the description below, and um, you'll get a free copy of our Q3 rebalance report. And you can also click a link below and get a free guide to using the Zach's ETF model portfolios for asset allocation. So if you haven't seen this stuff, uh, now would be a great chance to go ahead and click on those and have a look. So let's go ahead and get started for my, with Microsoft. Uh, again, just like the S&P 500, here's how the last decade impacted Microsoft. We can see that period of just in Microsoft's case, literally 13 years uh, where the price just did nothing and earnings played catch up. And the result was obviously tremendous, tremendous PE multiple compressions. Here's the setup for our factor sensitivity analysis. Again, we've got this expanded PE multiple, expanded PE multiple here, the distance between the blue and orange line, you can see that growing. That's multiple expansion. When you see the two coming together, that's contraction. Okay. So what we need to do is we need to first figure out um, what the correlation is for Microsoft between equity risk premium and the actual movement of the forward multiple. And um, I love using the interactive chart facility and the research system for this. Um, you can see on the screen here, I'm looking at roughly, I would say, about a 20-year chart. Um, equity risk premium's ability to explain the movement in Microsoft's PEF-12M definitely appears to be significantly, statistically significant and inversely correlated, right? So the idea is, and what I want to call everyone's attention to is we're going to run the stats here. Next slide. But I want everybody to take a look at this PE multiple expansion from the end of 2012, right? This is at the back end of the QE cycles. Um, this is where also Microsoft started taking on that, that concept of that enterprise subscription model. And look at that PE multiple expansion at the hands of that equity risk premium just continuing to decline, right? So we're going to basically run a regression now by clicking on this beta coefficients button that you see up here out of interactive chart. And when you do that, you're going to see that we have statistical significance, right? We have an R squared of 73%. What that's basically telling us is that 
Equity risk premium can explain 73% of the movement in the underlying PEF12M for Microsoft, and it's actually correlated at negative 0.86. Um, this is obviously a, a very, very significant uh, relationship that we, we cannot ignore. So we're going to look at method one. Again, this is the really, really easy one. Um, in, in our one to four panel charts uh, in the research system, all you've got to do is create a four panel with PE at the top, 10-year treasury second, equity risk premium third. Again, treasury yield plus equity risk premium totals up to the total equity discount rate. That's your fourth chart. Do a right mouse click on each of the three and throw the median trend line in there. And then um, what you're going to do is you're going to do a right mouse click and display data, and you're going to get this, this vertical data viewer. Um, and that's going to show you the values at, at literally each point here uh, in, your, in your title. And what we're doing, what we're looking for when we do this exercise is we are looking for the most recent period where treasury yields and equity risk premium equaled median trend over the last 20 years. You can see the red line. You can see that current value hitting the red line. So we model the same point where 10-year treasury basically equaled 20-year trend median and um, equity risk premium also equaling that 20-year trend. And you can see that from a historical perspective, what history has taught us is the last time we had a treasury yield of 2.84% with an equity risk premium of 5.13. We had a PE multiple of 23.76. So call it 24. We would expect the PE multiple for Microsoft to contract from 34, roughly, down to 24 if we get a reversion in equity risk premium and treasury yields back to their 20-year median. Now, how easy was that, right? That's very, very simple analysis very powerful analysis and we're going to prove that now using the valuation model. So this is method two. This is a real Wall Street DCF model. Again, I've got a huge cult following on this model. Um, the very first thing I tell everyone um, when they start up the valuation model out of the research system is just make sure that the model is in default mode. So you'll see user mo model here. You just click it twice. It'll get into the default. You just never know when you've modeled something uh, and you've left some overrides in that um, you may not be expecting. So make sure that's set to default. So the idea behind the Zach's valuation model is basically a five-factor model. We're not going to get into I could literally spend an hour just on the valuation model. It's not the point of today's webinar. Um, but we've got two macro factors that feed it, risk premium, uh, equity risk premium, and risk-free rate. Um, we've got three company-specific factors. One of them is a company-specific risk rate. When you roll those three up, you get the total equity discount rate. For purposes of my strategy work, I pretty much always leave the company-specific risk rate at zero. So we're just talking about the macro factors. Um, that's what gets us to our total equity discount rate of 4.3% in default. And then we've got a fulcrum point for earnings. Then we've got a slope of that normalized earnings trend line. And you can see that um, from prior webinars, I focus solely on normalized earnings trend. And you can see that that obviously comes from the valuation model as well. So all the points along this red line we're modeling. I'm more concerned about forecast, obviously, but here's the normalized earnings trend points along that red line. So the idea here is we want to pay attention to what we see um, in, in default. And in default, we take one standard deviation away from the forecast to arrive at an 8.2. You can see that at 8.2% growth, we get a PE multiple collapse from a model perspective, right? We're modeling growth at 23.85 and the current model return if 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 we were only going to grow microsoft at 8.2 percent we could expect a 28 percent decline in price so what this tells us is a lot right it tells us the buy side um holding everything else constant right because we get daily updates on all of our consensus estimates um, we know what the risk-free rate is we know what the equity risk premium is um that the buy side is in fact more or less bid the the um the market implied growth rate up substantially higher than 8.2%. And so what we need to do now is more or less model that. We've got to get this model into equilibrium. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to solve for that market implied growth rate. We're going to hold all these other inputs constant. And what I want everybody to note is the current model return and the model PEF 12M at that market implied growth rate of 11.74. So with the model in equilibrium, the model PE equals the actual PE, and the current model return equals zero. So we've basically taken out the arbitrage profit loss, and we've basically solved for the buy side implied bid to valuation in terms of a growth rate 
um, that the buy side expects Microsoft to grow at long term. And um, you can see that it's just a little bit less than consensus and taking away one standard deviation was actually a lot was was actually too aggressive. So what we need to do really quickly is just look at the sustainability and supportability of that 11.74% growth. I love to go into financials, growth and margin check and just take a quick peek. Again, what I always look for is changes in capital structure to determine whether I need to look at aggregate versus diluted growth. Uh, in this case, we've got a fairly stable capital structure. The one thing I am noticing here on the year-over-year -year percent change for earnings and revenues is that we did have a very large period of growth that was pulled forward for, for COVID for both revenues uh, and earnings. And so I'm more concerned with long-term least squares growth trends, specifically uh, related to the cloud business, that Azure server business. And you can see those, those growth rates picked up substantially between the five and 10-year mark on a least squares trend basis. So when you move into this view and you save the settings to the valuation model, you'll see that that 11.74 carries over and you can compare that rate that was implied to the actual long-term least squares trend rate. So 13, 14, 21, 22. So moral of the story is that we've got um, a Microsoft pretty much fairly valued at that market implied growth rate at 11.74. It appears as though that 11.74 is sustainable and supportable long-term. That's the whole idea. So. Now what we're going to do is we're going to set the risk-free rate to 2.9 and the, and the um, equity risk premium to 5.11. And we do this after we've solved for that market implied growth rate because now we're going to hold the market implied growth rate constant. We're going to plug in new macro factors and we're going to solve for a new model PE and a new model price and a current model return. Okay, So now we're going to basically model what happens when we raise the total equity discount rate to 8.01%, right? What kind of decimation can we expect from Microsoft's uh, PE over time? Keep in mind, this is going to happen over the course of perhaps five to 10 years, not overnight. Okay, so um, it's very important to realize that. And um, what ends up happening when you do this is you end up with a model PE that and, and again, you have to hit the calculate button. I want to rec remind everyone to hit the calculate button once you make these overrides. Be sure to hit calculate. And I want everybody to note that model PEF12M of 23.4. So basically what we did is the same exact analysis using a DCF model that we did actually just looking at the actual observed levels of these macro factors relative to PE. So this 23.4 is our model result with a change to the total equity discount rate to 8%. We got the same exact thing by just simply going to our one to four panel chart and looking back historically at when the most recent time period was that we had these macro factors trading at media. It gave us the same exact result. Here's our 23.76. Okay. So I've got that here for you in the notes. If you want a, um, a copy of the slide deck as a reminder of all this, it'd be a really good idea. Uh, you can reference this in the future, especially if you're a research system user, just go ahead and give us a call or shoot us an email. But here's your 2.340 um, implied valuation model result on a PEF 12M uh, versus the actual observed PEF 12M for that 331 point of 2376. So strikingly similar results are absolutely the same. Um, what I like to do is take it one step further and actually solve for the market implied growth rate that's required to to achieve the current level of PEF 12M of 33.18 with a total equity discount rate of 8.01. So now we're taking our analysis one step further. We're saying, okay, if the total equity discount rate increases from the four level to the eight level, what would Microsoft have to do in terms of an implied bid to valuation uh, in terms of market implied growth uh, to be able to support that current level of PE of 33, basically 34? And the answer, when you click on the market implied growth rate button after you've done this total equity discount change, is that Microsoft's current implied bid devaluation, they would have to grow earnings at literally 15.63%. Um, that's a huge, huge difference from the 11.74 um, that was implied um, based on the, um, the current levels of total equity discount rate. So anyway. Um, the results are, are strikingly similar when using the Wall Street model um, as they are when looking at the um, at the actual historical results. So what I want to do now is is do a live version of the valuation model. 
uh, in the Zax research system using Microsoft. So we'll go ahead and jump on that right now. So um, again, what I reminded everyone right up front to do was to go ahead and set the valuation model to default. And when you do that, you can see that we've got our 8.2%. We've got our current model return of negative 30%. Keep in mind that I put together the slide deck yesterday. I'm doing this live on a Wednesday morning. So these values are going to change just a little bit, not too much, uh, but just a little bit. And so the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to solve for that market implied growth rate. We've got to be able to get the current growth rate that the buy side has basically bid the valuation to so that we can hold it constant when we change that total FB discount rate. So to do that, all I'm gonna do is click on this right arrow and you'll see that every single click on that right arrow, and I'm just using my arrow key now on my keyboard, brings the model EPS growth rate up 10 basis points. And when you do that, each click, the model PE begins to approach the actual PE, the model price begins to approach the actual price, and the current model return begins to approach zero. And you can force the relationship by just simply clicking the MIG button, very simple. You can see that our market implied growth rate is in fact 12.03%, okay? So we do our sustainability versus supportability argument. We save our results, go into financials, growth and margin check. We already know that this 12% growth rate is sustainable, right? So we'll go back to the valuation model. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna hold this constant and we're gonna go ahead and plug in our change to risk-free rate and we're going to go to a 2.90 and we're going to go to a 5.11 and we're going to click on calculate and when we do that i want you to see that when we hold it at current fair value in terms of growth assumption that's what we solved for that's what the buy side is currently paying for microsoft is 12 percent and we plugged in the new total equity discount rate in the form of a 20-year median risk-free rate plus a 20-year median equity risk premium, we actually get that same 24 handle on a model PEF-12M. Okay, so again, it equals the observed model that was very, very easy to replicate in your one to four panel chart facility here. Okay, extremely powerful. So what did we learn, right? We modeled the valuation results for Microsoft using two methods. We used the very, very simple actual observed historical trend analysis in PEF 12M versus those macro factors to go back and look for that most recent point that lined up. And we just looked at literally what the PE ratio was when equity risk premium in the tenure was at that level. It was around 24 of PE. We did the same exact analysis using a Wall Street caliber DCF model called the Zach's valuation model. Um, a little bit more roundabout approach, very, very technological, but extremely effective. And we got the exact same result of a, of a warranted PE, a model PE of roughly 24. So we modeled those macro factors reverting to their 20 year median trend. I won't repeat those. Um, here's the result, right? The historical trend resulted in the current PEF loan decline from 3450 to 2376. And the Zach's valuation model analysis confirmed that with a model PE of 23.4. So the important point here is that both methods confirmed that all else held constant, including EPS. And this is super, super important. Um, if macro factors did revert to that 20 year trend over long run, Microsoft could actually face a 40% contraction in PE over time. Now, keep in mind, it's not going to happen overnight. And the price decline is actually going to be mitigated by EPS growth because each and every year that EPS growth is going to be, be growing at what's to be expected, what we discovered out of the valuation model, what's to be expected at about 11.74 um, based on current levels of equity discount or total equity discount rate. So very, very important to keep that in mind um, when, you're, when you're trying to, to digest these results. So the Zach's valuation model was also able to model the market implied growth rate necessary for Microsoft to sustain those current levels of PE if the macro factors revert to that 30 year or that 20 year trend. Um, remember that we, we, we received the implied EPS growth rate and that would have to rise from 11.74 to basically 15.63 to sustain current levels of 34X if we were in fact to revert back to 20 year trend on those macro factors. So my point here is, is that if, in fact, we do get a repeat of this extended period of a rise in equity risk premium, there's no telling if we are or not, right? It could be any number of long-term factors uh, take place in, in the global economy that would cause that. 
If we do get it, though, it's going to be a long term tug of war between EPS growth rates and what's being implied in terms of EPS growth, even more importantly, versus that rising equity risk premium. And um, that's what we're going to be looking for over the next couple of years. So um, stay tuned and we'll we'll um, we'll go through it uh, in future webinars. So. Um, be sure to join me next week, right? It's all going to come down to looking at um, the lost decades composite averages of valuation and performance. We're going to look at each sector in the S&P 500, and we're going to do that relative to the S&P 500. Um, and then we're going to look at each of the core earning certain portfolio strategies, right? So the core 75, the Admiral 30, and the, and the 25 stock dividend strategy. And we're going to see how each of those performed on a composite average basis relative to the S&P 500. We're also going to take a look at the ECP tilt portfolio's valuation and performance over the last decade uh, and take a look at that relative to the S&P 500. So it's going to be a really, really nice, easy to digest uh, wrap up next week. So be sure uh, that you don't miss out on this follow up uh, discussion. So that's about it for this week. If you find this video helpful, please hit the like button below and be sure to subscribe for future videos. If you have any questions or ideas for future videos, please leave a comment below or email me at tnyland at zax.com. You can also follow me on social media. I'm on LinkedIn and I'm on Twitter at Tim Nyland. If you're interested in getting started with Advisor Tools or ZRS, or if you're looking to upgrade your current subscription, please contact our world-class support at Advisor Tools at zax.com and ZRS at zax.com. Thank you for watching and I'll talk to you all next week. Mm -hmm.